Poppy Bible Church.
Jesus' words, he asks us to receive him like a child. And that when we come to him, we come to his kingdom like children who love and run to their parents with abandon and say, Mom, Dad, you're home, is the same way that we run to Jesus. And I think it's when we see children praising in loving Jesus. It's a special thing. It's Palm Sunday today, uh, and we know that Jesus walked into Jerusalem before facing his death to people who were anticipating him and wanted him to be there. But when they were doing that, oftentimes it was with a bad heart. It was with them wanting something from Jesus to fix something, to make something different for their lives so that their life is happier and better. But Jesus said, I got something infinitely better for that, infinitely better than that, and it's me. It's a relationship with me. It's complete access to Creator God through me. Come to me and not the stuff that I'll fix. Come to me and those things will happen. Seek the kingdom of God first and seek me first and those things will would happen, and that's what Jesus told to do. And we're going to invite our children out who are going to be praising Jesus. Only this time, on a Palm Sunday, we expect Jesus the right way to give our lives to him. So you guys may come out. is our prayer in this community and at this church, God, that we would have eyes to see needs around us, Lord, and show your love that you've shown to us on the cross. We pray for that. Because we know I need you, Jesus, and I know this heart needs healing so from my knees i lift this prayer to you my savior and for my life and for this world you're the answer jesus amen amen we are so glad you guys have chosen to come here together to worship our God, and it's been an amazing thing. I love being able to share this with you and share this time praising the Lord. You guys may have a seat. Before we begin, 
Evan mentioned Ellen Hull. If you are new or a visitor, let me tell you about this extraordinary saint. Um, she's a fixture around here, turned 89 about two weeks ago. And when I'm thinking about all the wonderful presents that I'm going to get on my birthday, what does Ellen do on her birthday? She calls me and she says, hi, Pastor Scott. How's your daughter that had a seizure? I just want you to know I've been praying for her. This woman is such a blessing to me personally and to this whole church. And you know what is cool? We have an amazing tech team here. One of the members of our tech team who I'm sure wants to be nameless. But, um, yeah, well, he'll remain nameless. But he's up there. Outfitted Ellen with a computer, a tablet, iPad, whatever, so that even though she's uh, in recuperation, having fallen and injured herself and is living with her daughter, she's watching these services live. So I thought it would be kind of nice for us to all stand up and face the camera. And on the count of three, we're all going to wave real big and say, hi, Ellen, we love you. On three. One, two, three. Hi, Ellen, we love you. Thank you, guys. What a wonderful lady. What an amazing woman. Well, once again, disregard the title on your bulletins. God led us in a little bit different direction. We're going to be looking at the Holy Spirit right after Easter and the fact that the Holy Spirit is not a force that one can control, but a force, a, a person who wants us to be fully submitted to him. So we'll, we'll look at that after, uh, after Easter. Today, we actually, I thought, well, Lord, should I preach a uh, um, Palm Sunday sermon? Should I preach a Palm Sunday sermon? I preach this Palm Sunday sermon every Palm Sunday since I've been here, and I felt called to do something different. But when I finished, I realized in many respects, there are similarities to Palm Sunday. You'll see those. Evan mentioned that on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem as a king. And the people exalted him, and they extolled him, and they worshipped him as he was riding into Jerusalem, and yet Jesus wept. And we, uh, in, in years past, we've talked about the fact that Jesus wept rather than celebrating and being all excited because they recognized him as king, but the king that they wanted him to be was a king who was going to improve the quality of life. He was a king who was going to get rid of their Roman oppressors, get rid of their Roman taxes, restore to them their political freedom. And what Jesus really wanted to give them was eternal life. They were fixated on the temporal, on the material. And what Jesus wanted them to be focused on was who he is. We're going to see uh, that sort of principle play out in the man that we're going to look at today. And it will challenge us to look at ourselves as well. Anybody recognize this building? Anybody? Anyone? Not a single hand. Has anybody here ever been to Singapore? Okay. And this wasn't there when you were there, Mark? No? Okay. So this building is an amazing architectural masterpiece. Believe it or don't, it's actually a church. It's the new creation church. The building is called The Star. And it's, it's really an amazing building. If I ever go to Singapore, which doesn't seem real likely at this point, but if I ever do, we are going to ask for a, a, an extra tithe at the end of the service so that I can go to Singapore. If I ever do, I would love to see this building. I would love to see my clicker work too. I would love to see this building just because of the sheer spectacle of it. I'm going to show you a different view of this building in just a, there it is, another view. And at the end, I'm going to show you the inside of this building. When they built this building, when the church built this building, they designed it to have a shopping mall inside, really nice restaurants, high-end restaurants, as well as inexpensive restaurants. And the thinking behind that in, in making this place externally and internally such a spectacle and providing so many uh, 
appealing draws. The thinking behind that was we want to reach more for Christ. We want them to come here. Maybe they'll come here for the shopping mall. Maybe they'll come here for the exercise classes. But we want them to come here, and then maybe they'll meet Jesus in the process. And I have to be sincere and say I applaud that effort. The Apostle Paul said, I become all things to all people. Paul, of course, drew a line on that. I applaud the sentiment, but I also have some concerns about that. Uh, I serve on the board of trustees for Western Seminary, and the president asked all of us to read a book. It was called The Prodigal Church. The, that's a short title. Prodigal Church, and I was so impressed with that, I asked all of the elders to read it. They read it about a year ago, and there was one line in Prodigal Church that, that really struck me, and that is, what you draw them with is what you will win. what you draw them with is what you will keep them with. In other words, if you draw them to your church because of a 10-piece rock band, laser lights, fog machines, and two glowing disco balls, when you lose those things, if that's what you drew them with, when you lose those things, we've lost a couple of band members. Remember, Ken and Shelley had to move away. When you lose those things, are they going to stay? If they come for the stuff, will they leave when the stuff is no longer there? So there is a concern, but I do applaud the desire to get as many in as possible. Today we're going to look at a guy named, history calls him Simon Magus. Magus is a Latin word that means magician. Now we covered, Pastor Scott, we covered these passages last week. We briefly touched on them. I'm going to review two or three, and then we'll go into new territory. We didn't really look at this individual. But he's an important guy, especially as we reflect on Jesus' sorrow at what happened on good, uh, uh, on uh, Palm Sunday. Jesus' sorrow, when you would think Jesus would be celebrating for the admiration, he's weeping. And, and Simon Magus is a good illustration of why, and a good warning and a challenge to us. So let's look at the three verses that we did cover last week. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city. Just a quick reminder, there was persecution in Jerusalem. God scattered the people. Philip fled for his life to Samaria. He preached in this hostile territory full of some of Israel's worst enemies, and the whole town became saved. So Philip has preached. They've heard the gospel. There was a man named Simon who had practiced sorcery in the city, and amazed all the people of Samaria. Look at the things that Simon may have to give up as we look at this passage. Think about the things he may have to give up if he's going to follow Jesus. Practice sorcery in the city, amazed everybody. He boasted he was someone great. And all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, this man rightly, this man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he amazed them for a long time with their sorcery. But when they believed Philip, when they believed the true gospel, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. All the people were baptized. They saw the truth of the gospel. Simon himself, even this sorcerer, Simon Magus, believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere. And, and we closed last time with this last clause, and I tried to sound a somewhat ominous, disconcerted note. He followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. And God the Holy Spirit, through the writer Luke, is focusing our attention on the fact that what caught Simon's attention what captivated Simon's focus was the very thing he had been doing, a better version of the very thing he had been doing all along, these signs and wonders, these miracles that he could see, what he could see and touch and handle. That seemed to be what captivated him. So there's three things that Simon's sorcery provided him that we see in that passage, at least three. Maybe you guys got more. First, we see wealth. And in fact, there's a tremendous amount of history, 
extra-biblical, non-biblical history about Simon Magus. He's known as the father of Gnosticism. Whether that's true or not, we don't know. He's known as the father of all heresy. And again, I think heresy began long before Simon. But we, we don't know for sure how he ended up. One historian, I think it was uh, Jose, jo, Josephus, I guess I didn't get enough sleep last night, or probably not enough coffee this morning. Um, Josephus recorded about him that he worked for a important Roman governor or proconsul. So this guy made a tremendous amount of money. Whatever he did, however genuine or carefully crafted his skill was, it earned him a lot of money, we know that. And of course, he had tremendous admiration. And with tremendous admiration comes influence and power. And we see all of that. This guy is called the great power of God. You can imagine he has tremendous influence over these people and is a wealthy man. And wealth by demonic forces is not something unknown to Scripture. As we get further in this book of Acts, we'll see in chapter 16 another person who is responsible for generating great wealth by demonic forces. Here's what Luke says about one of the journeys that he and Paul takes later on. He says, once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. This lady's predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. And the story goes on to explain that Paul set her free from this demonic spirit. And as one might guess, her owners were extremely upset with Paul because their finances were ruined. Her freedom meant their lack of financial gain. So they were not at all happy with Paul. But we see this principle that the realm of evil can make people wealthy. And Simon now has decided to follow Jesus. So how is that going to turn out? I have a question for you. You know I do these pop quizzes. You're not surprised. Would Simon's new belief and benefit provide would his following Christ supplement what he is called to give up? If he's going to follow Jesus, what's going to happen with the, with the attention, with the influence, with the power and the money? Is following Christ going to provide the same benefits, maybe even better benefits? And more importantly, was his belief genuine? So the pop quiz, belief genuine. What do you think? Hands. Show my hands. How many people would say, I think his belief was genuine? Oh, honey, did you listen to me practicing this? My wife got it maybe right. Oh, you just watched Mike and you copied Mike. Okay, well. Well, I'll answer that question in a minute. Was his belief genuine? I will answer that. Maybe these passages will help us. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. Oh, can I pause there? There's an interesting principle here. The apostles sent Peter and John. You know, Peter, who many say is the, the, the first pope, the founder of the church, Peter didn't send himself. Peter didn't send John. John didn't send Peter. But we see an interesting principle here that all the apostles together considered the matter and agreed, and the apostles collectively sent them off. And by the way, just a side note, that's what we try to do in this church. I don't call the shots. Pastor Dwight doesn't call the shots. Evan, well, maybe sometimes. But as a general rule, we make decisions as a board of elders. We submit humbly to one another, and we take directions from each other because we trust one another, and we trust the Holy Spirit. So, let me, let me continue on. When they, um, so, Peter and John are sent to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of hands, 
he offered the money. He offered the apostles money and he said, hey, give me this ability also so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered him, may your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you're in, that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing that you have said may happen to me. So let's go back to that question that Mike and my wife got right, but she doesn't count because I'm sure she heard me practicing in my office. Was Simon's belief genuine? Here's what James says that might shed some light. James says this, you believe that there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. James goes on to say, and they will suffer eternal torment, eternal torment in hell, in the lake of fire. They believe, remember, these demons were at one time angelic beings who lived and dwelt in the presence of the Almighty. They saw him in all his wonder and splendor in a way that we won't see until one day we meet him after this life. They dwelt in his presence and they believed in God in a way that we can't even imagine. Yet that belief, as real, as genuine as it was, meant nothing for them. Or think about what we looked at a few weeks ago in Acts. The Sanhedrin sees that Peter and John have healed a man that's lame, crippled from birth. Forty years they've seen this guy waiting on the steps near where they meet in the temple. And they said, what are we going to do with these guys? Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have... They've done a great miracle, and we can't deny it. They recognize the reality of God at work. That didn't save them. That didn't change them. Their solution was to administer a beating and to put these guys in jail a couple of times, even though they believed that what they saw was a genuine miracle. And let me see if I can get this clicker to work. Bang it. Clicker help? Clicker help? Anyone? No? So, Carolyn, could you bring me my cell phone? And I will use that until we rec recover our clicker ability. We're working. We're working. I always keep a backup. You learn this in court. In court, oh my, you do not want to have technological failure. That is just absolutely the worst. So you always have a backup. So, was Simon's belief genuine? We looked at these examples of so-called genuine faith, and I'm going to argue that the better question to ask, there it is, the better question to ask than whether his faith genuine. I think he had a real belief. But the question is, was it a heart-changing belief? Of course, he saw, he believed, he decided, I'm leaving what I've been doing, and I'm going to follow this guy, Philip, because what I see is the same thing, only it's bigger and it's better. Was it a heart-changing belief? That's the real question. You know, you've heard me use the phrase, Old Covenant, that we see in the Old Testament, the following of the laws to find a right place before God. And then in the New Testament, you've heard me use the phrase, the New Covenant, and one of the fundamental, or two, the two fundamental elements that distinguish the new covenant from the old covenant we read in the old covenant, we read from the Old Testament prophets that two extraordinary things will happen. They came to their consummation on the day of Pentecost. And those two things are when you become a follower of Jesus, he's going to give you a new heart. Outside of a relationship with Jesus, we have a dead heart. A heart of stone, the Old Testament calls it. And when you come to Jesus, he will give you a new heart that hates sin for the first time. A heart that hates sin and longs for more righteousness. This is the promise of the new covenant, but it's only a part of the promise because Jeremiah and Ezekiel also told us that God would then empower that heart by the Holy Spirit to fulfill the desire 
for righteousness, to fulfill the desire to obey Jesus Christ. Do we see that in Simon? I will suggest that as I punch my clicker that there are four reasons to doubt that Simon had that kind of a faith. And you'll see there that the word, you will see there that the word doubt is italicized. I don't say there's four reasons we conclude that he didn't have a heart change. We can't conclude that. Scripture isn't definitive on the matter. And being a Bible church, we trust Scripture. So there's four reasons to doubt Simon's conversion. The first reason is that we can see that Simon's focus is almost exclusively on the gifts. In, chap in verse 13 of chapter 8, 19 and 20, in both occasions, we see that his focus is on the spiritual gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit. And one of the most important points I hope I can make here today is that the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit are meant to be a lens through which we see the glory and the splendor and the wonder of the Savior more clearly. They are not an end in themselves, but the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit are there to help us see the fullness and the richness of the truest treasure. They are not the treasure, but a lens to help us see the true treasure more clearly. The second thing that causes me to doubt that Simon has that new heart is Peter says that Simon, he says, Simon, may you perish with all your money. That's a pretty ominous warning. The third thing that causes me some concern. Simon, or Peter says to him, you have a bitter heart. You're captive to sin. If one of the fundamental elements of the new covenant is a new heart, Jesus said, Jesus called it being born again. Being born from above, being born of the Spirit were all terms that Jesus used. If a new heart is one of the fundamental elements of a conversion, a bitter heart doesn't sound quite like the ticket, does it? And he's captive to sin, and Jesus came, he told us, to set the prisoner free, to break that captivity. And then finally, Peter said, Simon, your heart isn't right. Really sums the entire thing up. Your heart is not right. And so, as we move on to the next slide, please, there are a couple of questions that we should consider in light of what we see here about Simon. Some, two questions that we should be asking ourselves. One of the wonderful things, and part of the reason that we as a church moved from Luke into Acts is because as the people of Israel moved from Luke into Acts, they began to move out of their homes, out of their churches, out of Jerusalem. God has called us as a people to move out of this wonderful, warm, friendly place and to reach others with the good news of the gospel, to introduce others to the Savior that we adore. And so as we begin to do that, as we attend Pastor Dwight's class and the class that George and um, Bruce are teaching on evangelism, and, and very soon Joel and Garrett will be offering the same class on Thursday nights, and I know I'll see all of you there. Um, as we begin to embark out of Jerusalem and into the community, we need to think about the focus of our message. What is the focus of our message? Can I have the next slide, please? So, you notice the name of a church is blacked out here. Now, let me explain. The reason I've blacked it out is I don't want you guys all to go to Corpus Christi, Texas next week. When I read this, you'll see why I'm worried about that. Corpus Christi, Texas, Easter at church, at blank church in Corpus Christi, Texas. This was a couple of years ago. Looked like the episode of the Price is Right television show. 16 brand new cars, 15 flat screen TVs, full furniture sets, and other prizes were lined up 
to be claimed by anyone who attended the church's Easter services. Pastor Bill Cornelius admitted, well, yeah, the idea is a bit outrageous, just a bit, but he sees, us, sees it as an opportunity to share Christ with many people who may never go to church for any reason. Sort of like that fancy, big, beautiful church we looked at at the beginning. I'm going there because they've got a Ruth Chris Steakhouse. I don't want to go over to Round Table Pizza after the service. I'm getting me some of that name it and claim it steak. And Sorry. <laughs> the, the, the article goes on to say over two million dollars. Over two million dollars. And, and again, as with the church that has the mall and the exercise classes and the steakhouse, I applaud the effort. I applaud Bill Cornelius that he's calling people that might not ever come to church. And by the grace of God, we know that some will come to a saving faith. But what you draw them with is what you got to keep them with. And what's Bill going to do next week? I don't know. Let's click forward here. Anybody remember this? Anybody go to the Street of Dreams? Okay, a few of us. Does anybody know the inauspicious, the, the terrible end of Street of Dreams? And eh, not complete end. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it. You know, one of the things that we know as we think about evangelism is, hey, come follow Jesus. I've got a ticket to heaven. When you get there, you're going to have a mansion, not unlike this one at Street of Dreams. And indeed, Scripture does tell us that there is a mansion in heaven. Scripture tells us that not unlike that beautiful cobbled driveway, the streets of heaven are even better. You get streets of gold right? Streets of gold in a mansion. Why aren't they out there going to want to come to that? You know, the thing about the thing about the street of dreams is it kind of ended up being a street of nightmares. They got the first six homes built and then there was a tremendous oops, 2006, two years later, a worldwide financial crisis and the place went into bankruptcy and they never got the septic systems and the sewer problems resolved. And so then there was a big lawsuit after it finally came out of bankruptcy. Both of the attorneys were in the same building suing each other for homeowners versus Dark Horse. And the street of dreams was a street of disasters. Now, it's come around and maybe it'll be fine one day. But what are you promising people as you share the good news? Let me tell you something. I, I, I taught on a wonderful subject that is worthy of being taught in church. I, in, a, in a small group before Lenny and I came here, well, it wasn't a small group, it was a group of about 30 adults, and I was teaching on heaven for three or four weeks. And So I, I always like to begin a small group with a fun question. And I asked, tell me what you think heaven is going to be like. What will heaven be like for you? And one guy, a very good friend of mine, and, and he, he's a better skier than I am. It was back in the days when my feet still let me ski. And if you're a skier, you know there is nothing better than powder. And he said, when I get to heaven, I think, I mean, I really believe, I really believe that when I get to heaven, there are going to be ski hills that go on for miles and miles with waist-deep powder on 20-degree, crystal-clear, bluebird mornings. And I'll be able to ski for miles in waist-deep powder and never get tired. That's what heaven is going to be for me. It's going to be like the street of dreams. That's what heaven is. But is that what Jesus wanted people to come? Is that what we should draw them with? Powder ski trails as much as I love it. Jesus didn't talk about a street of dreams. Jesus spoke about a road that is very narrow and very difficult, rocky, and few will traverse that road. That's the kind of path, not a street of dreams, but a difficult, rocky road. But at the end of the journey, we don't see the end of the journey. We don't see a mansion. We don't see an endless ski hill where we never tire. We see something so much better. Well, only seven shopping days till Easter. 
If you haven't purchased my Christmas gifts, please come up afterwards and I'll share ideas with you. Seven shopping days till Easter. Doesn't that sound crass when we think about what Easter is really about? It's not about shopping malls and Ruth Chris Steakhouse in our church. It sounds crass. We would never do that, would we? You saw the film, invite people to Easter. Brothers and sisters, what you draw them with is what you will keep them with. What are you telling them? You're not telling them there's a Ruth Chris here, that's for sure. There is a round table down around the corner and we'll be there later. What you, what you draw them with is what you win them with. We would never promise them a shopping mall, but do we, do we tell them, come this Easter because we are the friendliest church. You are never going to find a friendlier church. And I've heard that from people who have visited, that we are one of the friendliest churches, and I think that is wonderful, and that is to be celebrated. So is that what you're going to invite them here for? Because we're warm and we're wonderful. What we focus people's eyes on is so critical. Do we want to focus their eyes on the attire of the body, or do we want to focus them on the head? The attire of the body of Christ is wonderful and it's beautiful. Christ is preparing a beautiful, spotless bride for himself. But it's all about the head. This is, of course, what Simon Magus completely missed. But let's look at the conclusion of this guy. There's a second question for you and me before we, before we go to Simon. I said there were two questions. What are we gonna, how are we going to invite people? But what about us? If I were to ask you, what's heaven about to you? What's it going to be like to you? I mean, for me, I got to admit, since my feet don't work, that ski hill sounds great if they give me new feet, but I really like super high-end sports cars. But what captivates your own heart? This is a question that we must constantly examine ourselves, as Paul said, about is Jesus Christ the all-supreme treasure for which we leave behind? all of the wealth and all of the admiration and all of the riches of this world, not to supplant them or replace them with something a little bit better, a little bit more financially lucrative, but to leave all of that for Him. Is that what heaven is to you? If you can go to heaven and be satisfied with a ski hill that you never tire on and a mansion and streets of gold and a Ferrari or a Porsche GTB, GT3, if you can go to heaven and be satisfied just with that, then that's a terrible tragedy because Jesus Christ is the focus of all Scripture and all eternity. And that's something we need to remind ourselves of each day because I am so easily drawn into worldly lusts. So easily drawn into worldly lusts. I want to end on a note of hope, though. There's a reason to have hope, even for a guy like Simon Magus, whom it looks like, and the Holy Spirit wants us to, I think, draw the conclusion, whoa, this guy's on dangerous ground. He's, he's replacing his, his magic, his income, all of that for something that's just going to do the same thing but a little bit better rather than Jesus. But there's a reason for hope, even for Simon. Oops, see, it worked. I think my thing worked. Can you go back a slide, please? Yeah. Click, click. Well, I'll tell you the reason. There is a reason for hope for Simon, and that is this. When you look at Simon and Peter's words towards him, as I was reading it, I, I thought, wow, we studied Ananias and Sapphira. Ananias and Sapphira were also captivated by money. They sold their home. They gave half of the value of the home to Peter, and that wasn't a problem, but they lied. They did it because they lied and said it was everything because they wanted to look good in front of their friends, all of whom were giving everything they had. They wanted to look good, plus they kind of wanted to keep their money. So money, admiration, like Simon Magus, were the important things to Ananias and Sapphira. And Peter didn't say, Ananias, you're going to die right now. Peter didn't say anything like that. And yet the Holy Spirit knocked him dead, dropped him dead. Dead! Here, Peter says, oh, man, Simon, your money and you, 
may you guys die together. And yet God the Holy Spirit chose in his infinite and perfect plan not to kill this guy. He didn't die. Brothers and sisters, that's good news. I do not know what happened. History has one story. History sometimes cannot, is sometimes as reliable and sometimes not so much. But what history says isn't important. What's important is that God didn't kill him. God wanted him to have yet another chance because God loves even those who follow with wrong motivation, who follow with evil motivation. God loves even those people. And Jesus died for those people. So as we think about that humorous video, and as we think about inviting folks here next Sunday, and I hope we all do, let's remember that what you draw them with is what you keep them with. And we want to draw them with the supreme treasure, the all-valuable treasure of infinite worth, Jesus Christ. That is where we want to keep the focus. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you that you reach out to people like Simon. And even when the evil motives of their heart well up, you still continue to reach out. God, help us to look at our own conduct. Think about how we invite others. And are we inviting them to streets of gold and mansions in heaven like Dark Horse? Or are we inviting them to the builder of that heavenly city, the one for whom all of it exists. And God, we choose to look at ourselves too and to challenge ourselves because we want to revel in the infinite treasure that is Jesus. Help us by the work and the conviction, and the wooing and the drawing of your Holy Spirit to treasure him above everything else in this world. And all of God's people said, our world needs Jesus. We know our world needs freedom. So give us eyes to see the hurting and the broken. Let our lives align with every word you say. And we know our world needs Jesus. We know our world needs freedom. So give us eyes to see the hurting and the broken. Let our lives align with every word you say. Sing, I know. And I know I need you Jesus I know this heart needs healing so from my knees I lift this prayer to you my Savior and for my life and for the world you're the answer Jesus Lord, I pray for boldness and courage as we go out, Lord, and that we would invite those um, who we love, Lord, to experience your goodness and your peace, whether it be here at church on Sunday next Easter, Lord, or our ongoing prayer for someone who needs Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.